Welcome to Series 3 of The Great Humbling. What does it mean to be humbled? Perhaps it's to be less proud, to feel less important, even a little defeated. From the Latin humus, ground, to be grounded, and humilis, brought to the ground, made low or lowly. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a poet, futurist, and recovering sustainability consultant. In the early days of the pandemic, I started recording these conversations with the author Dougal Hine, where we wonder together about the strangeness of the times we're in, the altered states into which they push us, and now, in this third series, the new moves that might be called for, if these really are times of being brought back down to earth. All right, Ed, this catchphrase, you're going to say it. Let's get ready to humble. <laughs> I don't know, I should say it like a World <laughs> Wrestling Federation announcer, because I think that's where it comes from. I think you should say it like PJ, sing it like PJ and Duncan. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get ready to humble. <laughs> I can't believe it took us three series to think of that. All right, I'm Diggle Time. Welcome to the podcast where the heavy dough of my ponderings is leavened by Ed's playful plundering of the word hoard as we wander about the times in which we find ourselves. It's been really great to be back and hear from so many of you over the, the past few days. People have been saying some very nice things. It doesn't always help with keeping it humble. No, it's true. But there's been some lovely listener comments, which we're very grateful and appreciative of. Anna Boyle in particular made a lovely point about the balance of trickster and truther. And she goes on to say, the ship of fools is where we live. And to take it too seriously is to become a victim of a plan we did not agree to. But to keep the trickster and the truther in a team bonds and invites all people in curiosity and in some way to be enabled to voyage across treacherous waters, picking up trash and treasure and repurposing as fast as we can. Uh, now, I, I hesitate to sort of join into the truther camp because that obviously has some other rather negative connotations. Maybe it's a term that's ripe for reclaiming. Exactly, exactly. And my brother also listened in and said the podcast was a great way to go to sleep. And he said your voice was very calming, Dougald. There you go. That's the kind of humbling feedback that's needed to keep my ego in check. I love the idea of this podcast as a conversation that starts conversations or that feeds into conversations that are already going on. That feels right. I feel like there's something now in what we're doing that is ready to travel a bit further. So it's really exciting to see people sharing and talking about the podcast. Everyone doesn't need to hear this, <laughs> but if you're listening and you think of people who do, then pass it on to them and get back in touch with us and loop us into the conversations that are going on because it's a very rewarding thing to be to be part of. So uh, what's this episode's instruction as you wreck the mic, Dougal? Are you ready for this? Move your ass. <laughs> One thing about this series, I find myself saying words that have literally never come out of my mouth. Why did this one seem like a good idea for a show? I don't know if it's really one of these new moves, an instruction we want to give to anyone. Maybe we'll figure that out over the course of this episode. So much as a, a topic that we both needed to talk about because it's been a big part of both our lives just now. And you asked me last week what I'd been up to since last series. And I didn't so much bury the lead as skip it altogether. Because the big thing that's gone on is that we've moved. For new listeners, um, my partner Anna and me have been working for the last few years towards creating a school called Home. And we often say it's a school that starts from and returns to the conversations that we bring together around our kitchen table. It's a pocket-shaped school. It's a, a gathering place and a learning community for people who are drawn to the work of regrowing a living culture and we've been learning a huge amount about that over the past year online through the Homeward Bound series that we've been running. And then there's a group that's kind of gathered around that that's carried on traveling further with us. And 
Two years ago, we sold our terraced house in Vesteros, the city where we were living, because we knew that we were ready to try and find a place where we could bring these kinds of gatherings together on our own ground. It got a bit scary last year because here in Sweden, I mean, things are very different to the UK. There's lots of empty, uh, depopulating rural areas. But even here, there's been this kind of green wave of people inspired by the ability to work through screens and cameras instead of having to go into the office every day and increasingly convinced that that's going to be part of life after the pandemic, as well as the temporary weirdness that we've been living through, people moving out from the big cities. And uh, we had the, this kind of phase in the summer and autumn of wondering if we were going to be sort of priced out of any possibility of what we'd been dreaming of doing. And then I think I told some of this story towards the end of last series, but we found this place. And at the end of January, we moved into this old shoe shop in Astavola, which is a town with a population of about 1,600 people. It's about 30 miles northwest of Uppsala, the, the university city. This building where I'm talking to you from was built in 1912 by the shoemaker of Astavola for his family. And in the beginning, it wasn't really a shoe shop. We've got the old plans of it. And it's clear that it was really a home and a workshop. And in those days, he would have been going out, traveling around to households and farms in the neighboring area, taking measurements, making shoes for people. And then gradually over the next two generations, it was rebuilt. So there's now this big kind of display windows that kind of chart the arrival of a more consumer version of capitalism, let's say, in small town Sweden. So now it's me standing in the display window at my desk with passing dog walkers peering in and wondering, what's that bloke doing in there? <laughs> and some days I wonder myself. It can feel a bit like being the, the definition of a self-facilitating media node. <laughs> and there are questions that come up for us as we start to get used to being in this place and in these buildings. And it's like, what does it take for us to be as useful to the place where we live as the shoemaker was in his time? And some days I wonder, isn't this just the perfect illustration of the post-industrial uselessness I was talking about in last week's show? <laughs> And I wonder, how do the people who make my shoes today live? Because I'm willing to bet that they're not able to build homes for themselves that match the house that the shoemaker of Astavola was able to build in 1912. I've now got an image of you as the sort of cultural regrowth, Nathan Barley of the Swedish hinterland. Thank you for that, Ed. I will <laughs> edit my LinkedIn profile appropriately. <laughs> No, we, we had a lovely mail, actually, a few hours after last week's show went out from my friend Dan Knaus, who's someone I've got to know through the, the community around the school and who's listening in from Alberta, Canada. He was picking up on that Sam Oberia piece about post-industrial collapse, just how obvious what Oberia is saying sounds from the perspective of large parts of North America. So this is what he wrote. When I lived in the upper Midwest, where the Rust Belt ends in Wisconsin and Michigan and becomes the grain belt of Minnesota, the Dakotas and Iowa, it was clear we were living in the shadow of the peak of their industrial development in every respect. Depopulated and run down river cities and small towns are common, with their grand main streets full of beautiful ruins or repurposed pipestone buildings still loved by people who struggle to maintain them. Even the small towns were once connected by active passenger rail to bring actors, musicians and other performers to their music halls, which are now repurposed, empty or gone. And I guess where I was going last week with the Burria piece is that often that story is told in the contrast between the, the Rust Belt and the big international cities, but maybe there's also this other more unsettling story to be told of oh, these Western countries that are home to us being just as a whole de-skilled and de-skilling places that are dependent on 
other parts of the world that are still looked down on within the imaginary that we're operating within. So I guess that's part of what I'm wondering about this week is like recognizing the privilege of being caught up in this green wave of people who are able to move further away from the big cities because of the changes that the pandemic has brought with the irony that this is what Anna and I had been working towards for years anyway. But then this larger sense of moving into inhabiting post-industrial ruins, into the remains of places that knew how to make the things that were needed and that don't know that anymore. I'm wondering if we aren't going to need to relearn those things over the next three generations. And as if our lives were arranged to provide a neat symmetry to these podcast (laughs) conversations, Ed, you're also on the move. Yes, after 25 years in London, uh, it's going from a love affair to a long distance relationship because I'm joining that green wave. I'm moving to a 300 year old wooden Norfolk water mill that sits above the river in a little place called Loddon, which means muddy river in Celtic, with the water actually bubbling and rushing beneath the kitchen floor. The wooden structure gives the building a feeling of being in a ship or or a mountain chalet. And some of the heavy metal cogs and wheels remain in place as a reminder of its industrial heritage. And there's been a mill on the site since the 14th century. But the current building arrived in the 17th and was originally powered by water and then converted to coal powered steam with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th and finally run on electricity in the early 20th. So I In a way, it's like a little microcosm of our ongoing energy transitions, you know, from water to coal to electrons and then back again to renewable electrons. At the time of the Doomsday Book, there were almost 600 water mills in Norfolk. But by the early 1800s, less than 100 of those remained, uh, although they'd been at least partially replaced by 400 or so windmills. And now there's barely a handful of obviously either left in working order, uh, mainly as heritage tourist sites. What's been really interesting as I've sort of dug into the history of the place is towards the end of its working life, the mill moved from grinding grist, which I have also discovered is the pre-prepared de-chaffed grain, the grist to the mill, to de-husking trefoil seeds, which is a type of red clover. And these trefoil seeds were bought from cultivation from right across the southeast of England and then exported mainly to Germany, where it was planted to produce lustrous meadows of animal feed, but also for soil restoration and rejuvenation because of its leguminous nitrogen fixing abilities. And and Loddon Mill was actually the largest red clover husking operation in the whole of the UK. And it's also obviously only a metre or two above sea level. So despite the fact it's 10 or 12 miles inland from the coast, what lies in between is primarily low lying reedy marshland. So with my fetching climate change hat on, I did wrestle with the quandary of existential flood risk. Um, And interestingly, the year your Shoemakers was built, 1912, was also the year the mill was almost destroyed by a downstream flood. But I did all my extensive research around various doom-laden sea level rise scenarios. And my ultimate conclusion was actually, barring extreme non-linear calamities, it will see me out, but may not make much of an inheritance for my daughter. But then I don't really agree with inheritance in that sense either. So if it gives her a magical childhood of otters splashing in the waters below and kingfishers diving off the back deck, then for me, that's what matters. So I'm really excited by the prospect of being more in flow with the river beneath rather than adjacent to the traffic flow on Brixton Hill. Being a kind of active preserver of a bit of that heritage myself, living in a you know, wooden building of living creaks and groans, finding more grist for my own mill of thinking, also attempting some export of regenerative seeds, and celebrating what I'm already jokingly calling the mill of impermanence. Oh, and it's haunted. <laughs> I like the way you just drop that in there. Go on then, tell us about the ghost. On the first floor of the mill, which is the sort of bottom of the building, uh, there are several stories of a figure of a man who walks down the stairs and various synchronous happenings of, you know, pairs of pictures leaping simultaneously from the walls to smash on the ground. So, uh uh, whoever it is, um, maybe a little agitated. Well, you've got all that to, to look forward to. I, I'm tempted to say that wherever we find ourselves, it's going to turn out to be haunted. You know, that famous line from William Faulkner, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Wherever you are is going to be tangled up with unfinished histories. And when we move, it's always a movement within time as well as a movement in space. Mm. 
You know, we move in here and we've got three generations of treasure and junk in the attic and the huge red barn in the garden. And that was part of the deal, to be honest. You know, we got the place without it going on the market because we were willing to take all of the stuff that the old guy couldn't face getting rid of. And we probably couldn't have afforded the price it would have gone up to if it had gone to to bidding. But, you know, there's a well in the garden and the shapes in the grass that hint at how else the land has been used before it became, for the last little while, a big green lawn. And it won't be one big green lawn for much longer, I can tell you that. And the seven old apple trees and the guy who came to prune them, we were chatting and he's like, yeah, it's going to take three years to to bring these back into shape. And I thought three years doesn't seem like very much when you finally find somewhere that you have no intention of moving from. It's like take nothing for granted, but it's the first time in my life that I've been somewhere that I would happily stay for as long as I've got left. And so there's this sense mm-hmm. of grafting onto the stem of the the first three generations of habitation on this site and moving slowly as we mm. figure out where this is, who we are in relation to the people we're meeting around us. And I you know, I wonder now when we talk about this series being about new moves, whether it's a bit like Dark Mountain where we started out talking about the need for new stories and then very quickly realised this might be as much about the need to recover or revalue old stories as anything else. So maybe there's some some old moves needed in the mix. I totally feel that. I mean, they say that moving house is the most stressful thing you ever do, but I anticipate this one with a strange sense of calm, partly for the same reason as it feels like the move, you know, rather than the next move. Yeah, when we go back to sort of move your ass... It definitely feels like a dancing instruction to me. Uh, It's something that should come out of uh, a musician's mouth uh, as a kind of challenge to the dance floor. Uh, And my mum gave me a copy of a book called Secret Bungie this week in terms of those old moves by a a local historian, which is about her her Suffolk market town. And I was reading it and there was an amazing section on the renovation of an old coaching inn where under the floorboards were 40 to 50 horse skulls placed in very neat rows between the joists with their, you know, incisor teeth resting on a small oak or stone block. And then the floorboards resting directly on their heads. And it immediately took me back to Martin Shaw talking about this tradition at the School of Myth um, and describing these East Anglian dance floors. And as an East Anglian boy, I'd never heard of it. But apparently it's an old practice, often found in in ecclesiastical buildings, apparently Llandaff Cathedral in Cardiff, under the choir stalls, and they have horse skulls to enhance the acoustic properties. And in this Ersham Street building in Bungie, they were in the rooms where music and dancing would have taken place. So apparently sometimes the skulls were also stuffed with coins, old copper coins, to add to the vibration. And interestingly, some historians argue that that acoustics argument is also a retrospective one. And that the real reason we put horse skulls underneath the floors was a much more primeval notion of a foundation of sacrifice to keep away evil. But either way, it really made me think of Move Your Ass because there's something slightly macabre, but also magnificent about it, bringing the magical and the musical together. And such floors have been found right across the UK, Scandinavia and Ireland, where they were actually described as adding makala, a fine, hearty echo Perhaps it's less move your ass than uh, export your horse skull floor tradition. There's a thought. It's less catchy as an episode title, mind you. (laughs) But listen, Ed, we've got a long way into the show and I'm waiting for the point where you get out your etymological trowel and start excavating. Have you got any finds for us this week? Yes. So uh, so move comes from the Latin movere, uh, which basically obviously means move, change, exchange to to go in or out, or actually to quit, which is an interesting um, angle, uh, and comes to us via the old French mouvier. And we're familiar with a lot of these definitions, I think. It's, you know, it's the change of house or business uh, that we've just been talking about in terms of our relocations. Uh, It's to go in a specified manner, uh, but also to change positions. So there's a duality there. 
It can also mean to make progress or develop in a particular way to maneuver or plan uh, around something. It's also about influence or a prompt to do something when our emotions are moved. Slightly more bureaucratic sense, it's the proposal for a discussion or resolution at a meeting. And then rather more prosaically, it's about emptying your bowels. There we are. I thought you were going to give us the etymology of ass. I was tempted. <laughs> but if we step back a bit now from our, our personal moves into the wider patterns of movement in an age of humbling, I want to talk about a curious book that I've been reading. Felix Markard's book, The New Nomads, How the Migration Revolution is Making the World a Better Place. And it's coming out this July. I'm sorry, I keep talking about books that aren't in print yet, because a lot of my reading these days is things that I get sent by authors and publishers. But I say it's a curious book because it starts out as one thing and becomes another. It starts out as the book that the subtitle promises, a standard issue, neoliberal peen to global mobility. And parts of it, to be honest, are exactly that, except that running beneath those chapters and emerging as the book goes on is the author's disillusionment with the world that he's been part of. Now, I met Felix because of something I said. In December 2018, I took the train to Paris to take part in a gathering called the Plurality University. And I, I was on board as soon as I heard the title, because anything that's defining itself in contrast to the singularity, the singularity university and all of that kind of Silicon Valley fantasy has got my attention. To be honest, I ended up spending most of the weekend hanging out around the edges of the event with Vanessa Andriotti from Decolonial Futures Collective and Bio Akomalafe, who I met for the first time at that gathering. And you know, those conversations alone made it worth the journey. I can remember the host of the panel that I was there to speak on as part of the official event, trying to dissuade me from talking about Extinction Rebellion and the Gilets Jaunes movements, which were kicking off on both sides of the channel that autumn. And she said, you know, we're here to talk about the future. I remember stepping out of the co-working space where we'd been gathered with its walls covered in post-it notes and standing in the park outside, looking down across the city and the smoke and the sirens and you know, thinking how much easier it is when we imagine the future as something that's kind of clean and out there ahead of us that we can talk about in rooms like that, rather than something that's already present and tangled up with where we are. But when it was my turn to speak, I said, we need something like an Alcoholics Anonymous for a whole culture, an admission of the depth of the mess we're in, a surrender of our fantasy of control that so often haunts our conversations about the future. And a year or so later, I got a message from Vanessa saying, you have to meet this guy, Felix, because he's talking about the same thing as somebody who's in recovery from addiction himself. And so he came to visit me last spring, and he's this guy who spent a good part of his life in the world of Davos, the you know, World Economic Forum. He's been an advisor to world leaders and all of that. And then in the past few years, he's had his worldview broken open as he first he went into recovery from his own substance addictions, but then began to recognise the same pattern of addiction in these centres of global political and economic power the self-important and self-comforting narratives of the billionaires who want to be saints, who want to save the world. And that's where the book gets interesting, when he turns on this world that he knows intimately. He describes this gathering called Brilliant Minds in Stockholm, where the wife of the former US ambassador to Sweden brings together all of these celebrities and American socialites and media moguls and so on, who've flown in on their private jets or in first-class cabins to listen to Barack Obama and Naomi Campbell and Gwyneth Paltrow talk about the flexibility quotient, which apparently measures people's ability to move, shift, change, progress, and flow strong with the current of the future, and about sustainability in the art of constant transformation. And he's like, these people really think they're the good guys and the ones who are going to fix the planet. And it's like having a fire brigade staffed by pyromaniacs. <laughs> and in the end, the argument he works his way around to in the book is that this world of 
you know, for want of a better word, the liberal elite, thinks of itself as the opposite of the xenophobic anti-immigrant currents that have been running through politics in the last few years. But actually what they embody and enact is a huge part of what generates hostility to people who are on the move in many parts of the world. And if we're going to overcome the toxic patterns of recent politics, he's suggesting then our best chance of that will likely come from somewhere more grounded with more of a sense of place and limits than the fantasy world of Davos. And at that point, I found myself thinking of something that Martin Shaw says in the opening pages of All Those Barbarians, which is one of the, I don't know, like five books Martin managed to publish <laughs> last year. He says, whatever myth has to articulate right now must include migration, peregrination and elucidation. There's many cultures on the move, some elegantly, some not so much. Now, I've written before about digging into a place and I stand by it, but I'm not naive enough to presume we all have that luxury. And on that globalised mobility point, I actually watched Ai Weiwei's film, uh, Human Flow, uh, the other night, which was made during the recent peak in the refugee crisis from uh, a few years ago. And it highlights the situation of the 65 million people currently displaced globally. And it centres, as as that period in 2015 to 2017, on the very visible million or so who fled Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan from Islamic State, civil war and the Taliban. I points out that when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, only a dozen or so countries had borders with extensive fences and walls. Yet by 2016, over 70 countries had various different constructions um, with the razor wired ones that popped up in Hungary and Macedonia, which effectively trapped tens of thousands of migrants during th that, that flux uh, being the most notorious. And I was left sort of reflecting that that flow of people is as old as human history. Yet when it's, when it's dammed like a river, it drowns the landscape in a pool of displaced human misery. There's one particular scene where he's talking about the appalling conditions faced by 13,000 migrants stuck on the Greek Macedonian border. And they're all sort of camped haphazardly around the railway line. And they're powerlessly watching these trans border goods trains passing through, which is a visceral image of the free movement of global products and trade, but not people. You know, it's fine for you to shift this stuff, uh, but the people themselves can't move. Uh, and there's a really poignant moment where he's interviewing Kurds in eastern Turkey, where an elderly couple described their mountain life before they were forced from their land. And they say, you know, we didn't work. And by that they mean, you know, they didn't have paid jobs. I'm sure they worked very, very hard. They didn't work because they actually made everything they needed themselves. And of course, Eye's artistic eye brings out some really powerful visual sequences as well there's there's one where there's african refugees in southern italy who are wet and freezing from this potentially lethal boat crossing they've just undertaken and they're all wrapped in these shimmering gold survival sheets like some dethroned royalty and then there's the the burning of the calais jungle as police attempted to clear the site clearing again the already cleared and the flaming oil wells of mosul in iraq we've all probably heard the, the oft-quoted figure of 17 years is the average time spent in a refugee camp. Although it's not actually the whole picture. There's actually many of these displaced people not in camps at all. And displacement by its very nature is often erratic and irregular. But the World Bank still calculates it as over a decade, the average amount of time people spend in this type of limbo. I had the experience a few years ago of spending a night in a beer hall in Tallinn with Killian Kleinschmidt who became somewhat famous for his role in running the Zaatari camp in Jordan, one of the largest refugee camps for people escaping the war in Syria. And in the end, he left UNHCR because he was too radical for much of the humanitarian sector as it exists today. But what impressed me about him was his refusal to see refugees as helpless people, necessarily dependent on aid. And in fact, his condemnation of the whole approach to camps as storage facilities for people, the need instead to work with displaced people to create cities with their own economies and systems of local governance, which is what he was doing at Zaatari. 
And it reminded me very much of Ivan Illich's speech to hell with good intentions, and then the work of someone like John McKnight drawing on Illich to create asset-based community development, which is an approach that says we start by looking at the assets already present within a place or a community or a group of people, rather than automatically defining them by the deficits, the lacks, the needs, which is a fundamentally disempowering move. And when I asked Kleinschmidt about all this, he was aware of Illich, but he said you know, his biggest influence was the experience of having become a refugee himself, because he was traveling around Africa on a motorbike in the 80s, and he got caught up in a civil war. And tens of thousands of people, including him, had to flee across the border to a neighboring country. And because he was there, and because he'd worked as a builder, and frankly, because he was one of about three white people in that situation, he ended up working with the aid agencies that were coming in. And that was what led him into that whole work. And I don't want to romanticize Kleinschmidt's story, but there is something there that's different to the experiences and motivations that most often lead people with the best will in the world into working with humanitarian aid and international development. You know, people don't often end up in that career because they had the experience of being displaced themselves. And I was thinking about these questions of good intentions during the week because I read an extraordinary text that Anna came across in her day job from Tobias Hubinet, who's a Swedish researcher, and he's writing about Sweden's anti-racist self-image. Apart from anything else, I thought this might be worth talking about as a point of comparison to what's gone on with the report of the UK Prime Minister's Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. And this is a text that's called Swedish Whiteness and Swedish Racism. And Hubinet starts with Sweden's role in the history of race science, going back to Carl von Linnaeus via the skull measuring of Anders Retzius and the creation of the world's first state institute of race biology 100 years ago this year with the support of all the parties in the Swedish parliament. He also points out the role of the Nordic race as a construction within the wider imaginary of Western race thinking as the whitest of the white, the elite of the white race and of humanity itself something that's still there in the far right in the US and elsewhere, this kind of elevation of this idea of uh, Nordic racial purity. And so Hubinet says, you know, what's at stake in Scandinavia and in Sweden is what you can call whiteness deluxe. What's more difficult to talk about, he goes on, is the whiteness of Swedish anti-racism both in terms of institutionalised laws and in terms of the opinions of the population. Sweden comes out as being like the most anti-racist country on earth. In fact, in 2001, the Swedish parliament voted unanimously to abolish the concept of race. So you can't even really talk about race, and therefore it's quite hard to talk about racism in modern Sweden. And yet, at the same time, you get cities that are among the most racially segregated cities in the West, you get a job market that is among the most racially segregated in terms of excluding people from the protected, secure, well-paid end of the Swedish system on the basis of their ethnicity. And so you have this, what Hubinet calls an abysmal paradox of Sweden's anti-racist self-image and the experience you're likely to have as a non-white person in Sweden. And I saw this fairly close up because, you know, when I came here, I went to Swedish for immigrants classes and most of the friends who I made, some of whom I'm still in touch with and still see in those classes were guys who had come from Syria in the first wave of people escaping the war there. And I've seen the difference between their experience of finding their way into Swedish society and just the everyday texture of the encounters they experience and how it is for me as a white English guy coming here and making a life here. So Hubinet says what you've got is in the early 20th century, Sweden had this nation building project that was based on race thinking and that this gave way to 
a nation building project in the later 20th century based on anti-racism and multiculturalism and the self-image of Sweden as a moral superpower, a force for good in the world. And what both of these have in common is that they involve this self-image of being whiter than white, the most superior, the most elite, the most utopian version of Western modernity. And that's still hugely part of Sweden's story of itself. And now that's in a crisis that Hubinet describes as the melancholic crisis of Swedish whiteness. There's no way out of this crisis other than some kind of a breakdown, which in practice means psychic annihilation. There's something here that feeds around to what Felix Marcard is saying about the delusional good intentions of the Davos world. Mm. And what Killian Kleinschmidt is pointing to in the failure of the humanitarian aid sector to treat refugees as capable human beings rather than poor, dependent victims. And it seems to be about that narrative that, that we try and tell ourselves. You know, you mentioned the, the commissioned report published last week in the UK, and it's been suggested that Boris Johnson had actually decreed that the story of racism in the UK be changed. The commission was essentially briefed to produce that outcome which was likened by one consul to, who was a very senior former Asian Metropolitan Police Officer called Dal Babu, who said the commission was described as being a bit like faulty towers, as such was the, you know, the obvious chicanery uh, of the views being cherry-picked and hand-picked from a set of narrow perspectives, who then turned up and basically gave pre-written exam question-style answers. Again, there's no escape route, is there, from that, because it becomes then a narrative of utter denial of reality that once again plays to this sort of British mindset of, you know, we're always the plucky underdog, champion our sense of fair play. And it was that narrative which allowed us to conquer everyone and exploit the world whilst being, you know, a fair playing plucky underdog. What I think the the British report does is it, it, it actually doubles down on the sort of culture war divisions that play out in the US, it, it actually sort of almost seeks to completely deny the perspectives and experiences of a large swathe of the population and basically say everything's okay. And if you don't think it's okay, uh, you know, don't worry about it because your views don't count. So, one other thing I read this week that maybe fits in somewhere within all of this it's a messy story, but it is one about waking up to complicity in a way that has parallels to Felix's book. This is Daniel Pinchbeck, psychedelic author, has a piece on his Substack newsletter called Life and Death in Tulum, where it sounds like he's coming to a point of disillusionment with this new age world that he's been part of. And he's writing about Tulum in Mexico, where he's been living during the pandemic. And he says... Ecologically, it masquerades as a tropical paradise. In reality, rapid overdevelopment and lack of proper sanitation are causing severe ecological problems. It's also increasingly violent, with shootings and homicides on the rise as the cartels move in, responding to the tourist demand for drugs. The night before writing this, I hosted an event at a beach hotel, one of a series of events exploring UFOs and extraterrestrials, during this event, two young women from Norway communicated with the Arcturian Star Council, which describes itself as a ninth dimensional ET and delicately implores humanity to enter our heart consciousness. Next door, there was a shooting. People trying to get to our event were greeted by flashing sirens and a body lying in the road in a pool of blood. And uh, this takes him to reflecting on things that Slavoj Žižek has said about the the complicity or the suitability of a lot of new age and post new age spirituality for the state of capitalism and late modernity that we are in the way that it sort of acts as not a force for change but as a, a way of feeling okay when you're in a privileged position in a very fucked up world. And you know, Pinchbeck talks about his growing realisation that most people will continue their habitual behaviours, no matter how destructive, until something, some shock, intervenes to break the old patterns. So again, it's this image of having to pass through 
a breakdown, to hit rock bottom in AA terms. And I have to say, I don't trust the vision of humanity making a jump to a new level of consciousness that is what Pinchbeck seems to be steering by. And my sense is that this singular story about the trajectory of humanity is itself part of what needs to break down. But with all our flaws and the things we're seeing differently or not seeing or not wanting to look at too closely, I'm still struck by the way these different narratives that I picked up this week are converging on a recognition of the need to pass through some kind of rock bottom. And maybe we can bring that back around to that deeper instinct to move, which in some ways perhaps stems from our nomadic roots and the need to establish kith, to to, to take a stand, to dig in, a relationship with place, a landscape and a home. Yeah, something Felix points out, the root of the word nomadic is the Greek nemean, pasture. So even to talk around nomadism is as much about a relationship to place as it is to the movement around and between places. Maybe actually what encapsulates all of this in terms of move your ass is we're all just striving to move closer to what we need, whether that's the relatively desperate migrant in search of a better life to our own sort of low intensity, privileged desire for a more beautiful place to raise our children and do our work. Um, I mean, in many senses, the motivation is the same, even if the very visceral existential needs are clearly not. And I thought it would be powerful just to finish with perhaps a little extract from Somali poet Wasan Shire's poem, Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So to move your ass can be about survival. It can be about relocation. It could be about a shift in perspective, perception or position. It can be about metaphorically proposing a motion or literally having one. And perhaps ultimately, it's as much about moving your heart as your ass. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. If you're new to the podcast, we'd invite you to check out the journey we've been on over the earlier episodes. In Series 1, we explored the sense-making stories taking shape through the first months of the pandemic. And Series 2 tracked the altered states of consciousness, being and feeling that we were seeing around us. This is an open-ended process, and we're keen to hear from you. So please do comment, ask questions and respond via our Facebook page, The Great Humbling, or on Twitter where Ed is at Frucool. We're grateful to all of you who've been giving ratings, reviews and recommendations and sharing this podcast along your networks. And if you want to get deeper into the territory we explore in these conversations, do check out aschoolcalledhome.org where you can sign up for live online courses and events. These are extraordinary times, a moment of initiation at a cultural scale. So thank you for being with us on this emergent journey. Mm -hmm.